Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be here with you. Welcome to the panel discussion dedicated to the Syrian conflict and to the way to peace. Now, the Syria war enters its seventh year. Hundreds of thousands have been killed, more than half of the country's population dislocated. And while let's put an end to the Syrian conflict seems to be the main mantra at all high-level talks around the globe, no tangible solution is seen in a way as of now. Sometimes it even seems that things are getting even more complicated with so many global powers involved with their interests involved and colliding. Yet another peace initiative is underway here in Astana, the Astana Talks, and today we'll talk about how can we end this tragedy and what's going to happen after it's over. So if I may, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, first speaker is Kairat Abderrahmanov, Kazakhstan's foreign minister. Please, foreign minister, come up. Abdullah Gül, the 11th president of Turkey, Mr. President. Kehan Berzegar, director of the Institute for Middle East Strategic Studies from Iran. Salim Hudaifa, political representative from the Free Syrian Army. Ela Ibrahim, the Syrian journalist. And Shahida Tulaganova, journalist, producer of HBO's Christ from Syria documentary, will be joining us shortly. Dear speakers, welcome to this panel. I'd like to start with each one of you. Just a few words, maybe a minute or two. Um, Foreign Minister, we're going to start with you. Thank you very much. It's my honor and pleasure to address such a distinguished forum. I join previous uh, moderators in welcoming you as humble representative of the host nation for traveling and visiting uh, our country and beautiful city of Astana Expo and of course this very forum. Syria. What is going in Syria is a terrible disaster. It's a terrible disaster for its people. It's a disaster for region, and it is a disaster in global scale. And Kazakhstan and its president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, are doing their best in order to contribute in finding a peaceful solution for the settlement of situation in Syria. Thank you. Thank you. President Gül. Well, uh, uh, thank you first, and I think this is the right place uh, to hold this uh, discussion because uh, Kazakhstan has been the center of intellectual and political efforts to uh, push the dialogue and uh, talks uh, uh, and uh, ask the political solution for many uh, problems in the world. So therefore, I'm sure that uh, uh, this discussion also will uh, contribute to, for the solution. And I'm sure that the uh, meetings are taking place here. They will be uh, successful at the end because after a long time, the real result is being produced here, and it's the first time that the two sides are face to face and on the table. Thank you. Mr. Ibrahim. Good morning, and thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, I think it's very indicative that we're discussing the Syrian issue with actually a very small Syrian participation in this discussion, with the, where the majority of those discussing this issue are, represent regional and somewhat international powers. And I think this reflects how difficult and how complicated the Syrian conflict has become in recent years. Many people in my country in, and in Damascus, where I come from, would call uh, the level of involvement of regional players and international players in the Syrian conflict the main reason behind what we're seeing in Syria nowadays. You called combating terrorism a mantra, and unfortunately, it's a mantra that some people use with a great deal of hypocrisy, excuse my language, because it's used uh, often to justify 
uh, actions on the ground that are not uh, justifiable otherwise. And uh, I think uh, through this discussion, we can uh, perhaps address the more core issues that have created terrorism and that have caused us to reach the situation where we are right now. Uh, as we are now discussing uh, uh, a phenomena of uh, radical groups controlling parts of my country, I think we should understand that these groups did not come out of nowhere. They ha there are reasons behind uh, their appearance and their rise to power. And uh, actually, at some point, I think they controlled over half the country. Thank you. Mr. Barzagar? I think this is a positive step because it's basically a process-oriented negotiations. For the first time, we are witnessing the technical issues are being addressed. And given the fact that this is a multi-layer crisis and we are dealing with a phenomenon uh, that is terrorism or Daesh, other things, that crosses from the uh, national borders, uh, this is uh, a great uh, significant uh, fact that the different states took the first level, I mean, uh, Iran, Russia, Turkey, at this uh, context, and uh, hopefully other actors can join this at the second level, and that would be a good start for solving the situation in a permanent way. Thank you. Mr. Hudayfa. I guess we have more than six years now. We try to discuss the Syrian issue and without, with, uh, with no result for the last six years. And the uh, blood flow uh, still in Syria. I uh, hope we can come out with something now. We can provide it to the international community to move forward to do something for my people. Thank you very much. Foreign Minister, I'm going to start with you since uh, the latest initiative to make peace in Syria is taking place here in Astana. So um, how much hope do you put in these talks and why do you think Astana will work where others have failed? Well, this very distinguished audience uh, might know that the whole process uh, started when two esteemed presidents Vladimir Putin of the Russian Federation and uh, President Erdogan of Turkey approached my president, Nasultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan, with the request to consider the possibility that the capital of Astana, of Kazakhstan, Astana, to host a meeting uh, between Syrian government and armed opposition groups those who joined the renowned ceasefire agreement dated back to 30th of December 2016. And it was my president who agreed to immediately, by the way, it was not just spontaneous reaction, but it was after that quite a deep uh, previous consideration of the situation in Syria. He immediately reacted by agreeing to provide a platform of Astana to the meeting uh, under the auspices of three guarantor states. At that time, in fact, uh, only two states, Russia and Turkey, uh, backing these above-mentioned ceasefire arrangement. Later, as you know, during Astana, one of Astana meetings, Iran officially joined as a guarantor states. Why Astana? Uh, you may know that uh, around two years ago, it was in 2015, my capital uh, had an opportunity to welcome here some group of uh, Syrian opposition. Uh, it, it was quite an experience for our country to try to create some conducive environment, especially for Syrian opposition in order to give them a platform to express their will and wishes. And this meeting, or under the aegis uh, of Astana process, when three guarantor states also bringing to, the, to that meeting a representatives of the Syrian government as well as of armed opposition groups, those who joined above-mentioned ceasefire uh, arrangement, 
uh, in addition, uh, United Nations and the United States of America, and later Jordan, all of them been invited as observers. The role of the United Nations is crucial. We consider Astana process as a complementary to the Geneva one. We support the leading role of the United Nations and of the special representative of this very organization and its secretary general uh, to lead uh, the Geneva process to finding a political solution. There are, as you know, uh, three elements at Geneva, including elections, constitutional reform, government, and the fourth one is about combating terrorism. And Astana probably is going to complement to that fourth uh, item of the Geneva agenda. And in general, in general, my country is quite renowned today as a peace-loving nation, honest broker, and we proved it during our successful chairmanship at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Now we have even higher commitment being a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for the 2017 and 18. And it was my president who addressed this highest body of that world organization in January 2017 with his political address calling uh, the United Nations and in fact all nations around the world to finding the ways to um, solve conflicts and even to prevent them. Later on, maybe I will have an opportunity to brief you about some of initiatives of my president. Thank you very much. As you pointed out, United States is here just an observer and isn't party to the Astana talks as of now. Do you feel like there can be success in Astana without the United States? Well, I have now a splendid opportunity to comment Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, for his firm commitment for finding a peaceful solution to that awful situation in Syria. It was him who delegated his acting assistant secretary to participate in Astana 4 as an observer. And it was, if not a breakthrough, but it proved the commitment of new American administration to this process, and we really appreciate it. Uh, now it's time for uh, real actions on ground, the creation of four so-called de-escalation zones in Syria proved to be so far the only one very viable and concrete deliverable from any processes uh, uh, le le leading to the peaceful settlement of situation in Syria. And I hope very much that all observers, including the United States, will pay due attention to uh, that um, achievement within the Astana process. Of course, much depends on guarantor states. I just refer you to the text of memorandum, which has been signed uh, by uh, guarantor states during a previous meeting in Astana in uh, early May. There are so many uh, interesting details in, the, in that uh, very important documents including on how to make sure that these de-escalation zones, four of them, to be effective and to uh, be working for the finding above mentioned solution to that crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Foreign Minister. Um, President Gül, um, me and you had an interview last September and many things have changed since then. Despite the differing interests of all parties involved, there is one thing that unites everyone at this point, and that is the wish to eliminate ISIS, including Turkey. So the Syrian Kurds from the YPG militia, whom Turkey is calling terrorists, are storming the ISIS capital, Raqqa, right now. They're actually the most effective fighters against ISIS on the ground. Surely they will want a seat at the peace talks table later, after the defeat of ISIS. How's that going to sit with Turkey? Because if Ankara is going to play against the Kurds, surely that will hurt the chances of the final peace. Uh, first of all, uh, we are the neighbor of Syria. We have uh, 
900 kilometer border with them. And the Syrian people are uh, our neighbors uh, and our brothers and sisters. To see them in uh, pain and suffering is also suffering us. And uh, it's also a shame for all of us, for the humanity, to see the uh, suffering, killings of hundreds of thousands of people, millions of refugees there, and destroying of all the beautiful cities. This should be stopped, of course. But if we don't uh, prevent this type of conflicts, then it is inevitable to see the vacuum in the region. And this vacuum created the radical movements there and then the terrorist groups. Uh, at the beginning, maybe, many of these people we call terrorists, maybe there were ordinary people of the Syrians. When the problem started, some of them joined the fight just to protect their families, towns, cities. And the brutality of the war and conflict ended up as a terrorist there. Of course, there are some professional, very radical terrorist leaders, but the supporters of these people were not the terrorists at the beginning. It is the process. The process produced that type of people in the region. And there are many reasons. We have to get the lesson, of course, from Iraq. Unfortunately, we didn't get. Then it was repeated in Syria. Now, no one will tolerate, of course, that type of uh, people, that type of uh, groups. Uh, because uh, they don't recognize any standard. They don't recognize I mean, any standard of human rights. Uh, and this type of groups and this type of administration they impose, they, it's not sustainable. We all know this. So uh, together with all the international community, we're not allow this, I'm sure that uh, they will be defeated. But after defeating of them, what will happen? This is the question. So the uh, solution is not military, militarily only. If we believe that militarily we will defeat them, uh, then everything will be silent, we are mistaken. On the one side, yes, it's necessary to use force. But on the other side, we should also understand the reasons that this climate produced that type of organizations, that type of people. We have to eliminate that also. So uh, we hope that uh, the political solution is uh, found between the uh, two sides. And uh, Syria, again, became the land for the, all the Syrians, all together, to live in peace. Of course, this is a long process. We have to be realistic. But territorial integrity, political unity of uh, Syria must be uh, preserved. Otherwise, there will be other groups, revanchist groups. Uh, then the uh, blood will continue. Mr. Gil, you're as diplomatic as ever, but my question was precisely about the Syrian Kurds. If the post-war settlement does include autonomous Kurdistan in Syria, what will Turkey do about that? Uh, well, uh, I want to make it clear that the Kurds are our friends and our relatives. Turks and Kurds, they are brothers, sisters, so they are not the enemies of each other. They should be known, first of all. But uh, there is a group among them that, uh, unfortunately, for a long time, they are uh, f uh, 
the yeah, fighting with the Turkish uh, uh, state. And uh, there is no justification for that. Now, there is a group very much affiliated to this PKK organization in Syria, and they are uh, exploiting the situation over there and uh, trying to have uh, control on some of the region of Syria and uh, very conscious that they are expanding the, the land that they control for the political reason and they are making demographic engineering and pushing the people, the other Arabs and the others out from that region. We see this is very dangerous because uh, first of all, the, the Syrian people will not allow this. And uh, the territorial integrity, political unity of Syria should not be put at risk. This creates risk there. And also since they are very much affiliated with PKK, it's a threat uh, for us. Uh, our threat conception is very clear that uh, we don't want to see any uh, organization affiliated with the terrorist organization there. But it's also our responsibility, the neighbor's responsibility, to create the secure place for all the Syrian Arabs, Kurds, and then the Kurds, Syrian people should be happy, should be safe, and should be equal citizen of the Syrians. So this is something else, and we defend this, and we fight for this also. Uh, but uh, just uh, exploiting the situation and uh, getting the advantages of the vacuum, uh, I think no one should uh, create de facto uh, zone for them. Thank you. Um, just one last question. I remember in the interview that we did in September, um, you also very diplomatically said that may accept a compromise, Turkey may accept a compromise with Assad if it suits all parties involved, if it helps bring peace. Can we expect Turkey now to help Assad somehow in his fight against ISIS? Uh, I think it is, it is well known that uh, the political solution is the only solution. And for this, the both sides, uh, should be realistic and should understand. And also, the old neighbors should understand and should uh, help them to come together and to, to, to understand. Uh, at the beginning, unfortunately, there was no exit strategy. It's easy to open the front. I mean, the human history is full of the lessons. But uh, if without any strategy, exit strategy, if you uh, open the front, then uh, unfortunately you end up uh, like this cause. And it's, it's a heartbreaking uh, uh, what's happening in Syria and millions of uh, people are really suffering and uh, the, the refugees. So uh, I think uh, it's good for all of us, for, for Syrian people, first of all, of course, it is their land, it is their life. And if we are their friends, their supporter, we have to help them to be happy, to be secure, and to live together in their country. Uh, for this, uh, the neighbors have responsibilities. I remember the Iraq war, for instance. That time I was the uh, prime minister. Uh, right away after the Iraq war, we had a neighboring country's meeting of Iraq and all the neighbors, Iran, Saudi Arabia, at least seven years, we came together regularly and we defended the unity of Iraq and we recognized that Iraq should continue as a country uh, sovereign. Uh, then, we did not allow any proxy war that time. Unfortunately, this time, uh, maybe it was inevitable because of the 
strateji at the beginning, uh, it turned the proxy war at the end. So uh, I believe that all of us should get the lesson and should tell. But also the regime should realize that that type of regimes cannot be uh, acceptable in this age on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, one party rule, autocratic states, lack of law. Uh, so this, this cannot survive. This cannot survive at the end if you don't change yourself, if you don't transform yourself, if you don't meet the uh, demand of the people, then there will be uh, problems inside and outside. Now, I'm sure that uh, everyone inside and outside, they became more realistic, and now it's time to understand each other, and it's time to compromise, and it's time to create new Syria, that all the Syrian people, it's a very colorful country, we have to know, they should live together and we have to guarantee their uh, togetherness over there. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Berzegar, my next question is to you. Um, Tehran, just like Moscow, is invested in the pro-Assad course. Do you feel maybe manipulated by Damascus at this point because you can't really pull out? You have no way back, just like Russia doesn't. Can't abandon its ally, yes, it seems like that the Syrian government right now wants to achieve a military victory more than it wants a negotiated peace. Maybe you feel that way. And what kind of pressure can Iran put on Assad to commit to the peace process in earnest? First of all, we should understand that this Syrian crisis brought a lot of security challenges for Iran, too. And the Iranian-Russian relations out of their traditional relations, it's new in this degree from 2014, from the time that Daesh attacked Iraq. So there is a very strong national security sense, both for Iran and Russia. As far as concern to Iran, as, it, as the national security is somehow connected to Iran's foreign policy, and to be honest, I think this has a very a strong, uh, you know, continuous determination, popularity inside Iran, because the issue is somehow how to tackle this, uh, you know, terrorist uh, direct threats to Iran's national security. Therefore, if you have this kind of strong sense of uh, national security trend at the level of a state, uh, you will see that Iran and Russia, so far as they can make the same case, can go ahead and uh, it is uh, very interesting to see that how much uh, their both relations in the course of the crisis became more adjusted and more in a common sense to understand the, the benefit of uh, staying with each other. But in terms of uh, compromise, I think for Iran and Russia, uh, they, they both know that this continuation of the crisis is costly for both of them. The way that they are trying to accelerate political solution is showing that how much they would like to uh, manage this crisis. I mean this, uh, I'm saying this because uh, I believe that Iran has an exit strategy of this crisis too. Therefore, but this compromise you're mentioning cannot be individually made by Iran. As I mentioned, uh, as the issue is connected to Iran's national security and directly to the people of Iran in the context of the threat. So the Iranian government needs to uh, somehow justify any compromise when it goes to making the case, because the case is battling terrorism, spreading terrorism. Syria might not be connected uh, through border with Iran, but through Iraq it is, uh, it is important that connects to Iran. Therefore, it goes to national security context. Compromise, when it is being made in a collective way, I think it's acceptable for Iran. That's why I think this Astana uh, negotiations is, uh, is a positive step because it is focusing on a subject. 
It is not, uh, it is not in the context of uh, the traditional geopolitical rivalry between a state that Iran and Russia, for instance, make a coalition because they want to win the Syrian crisis, or Iran and Turkey, or, or Turkey and Russia. They are working on the subject. The subject is that we, we should focus on the national ter uh, in, uh, territorial integrity of Syria, sovereignty of Syria, and we should also think of this, any situation in the possible after Assad you know, uh, context, because we are, we are dealing with uh, you know, violent and terrorist uh, activities that can take over uh, the country of Syria, which is not benefiting uh, other neighboring countries. Therefore, I think so far as uh, uh, if there is a kind of collective effort by all actors, and here I think uh, although this, uh, this uh, you know, negotiation between Iran, Turkey, and Russia is going ahead, but I'm hoping that at the uh, second level, it, it brings also the United States and Saudi Arabia, the two other involved actors, because at the end of the day, the Syrian crisis, despite all of the challenges it brought for the international community, uh, at the same time, uh, realized other countries that they have a strategic constraints, they cannot manage the crisis individually. They need to somehow work with each other to go in that regard. Uh, in the context of Iran, I think Iran is ready to do that at Iranian diplomacy in the previous uh, conflicts like in Afghanistan and Iraq showed. In the process, the hope is that every individual states will adjust itself with the situation, and that is a good way of to do that. But my question was about right now, do you feel that Iran and the Syrian government are in sync when it comes to uh, negotiations? Because from the outside, sometimes it does seem like that parties involved want to negotiate peace, but the Syrian government goes for a military way and manipulates uh, the allies that way. I think, I think when it goes to the political solutions, yes, Iran is, uh, 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 willing to do that uh, uh, because continuation of the military, you know, operation will not, at the end of the day, uh, lead to perhaps a total win with the Syrian government. The issue is that how much you can balance the situation on the ground and accelerate the political solution. I think Iran's position is that to process this political solution and uh, and reach to peace, a sustainable reach that can be acceptable for different parties in a sustainable way. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hudaifa, my next question is to you. Now, despite the fact that the Syrian opposition is sending people like you to represent them uh, here in Astana, I think many would agree that the difficulty is fluidity because you are here to talk to people from the Free Syrian Army, but on the ground, one day an armed brigade is part of the Free Syrian Army next day it becomes part of an extremist group and then it goes back to being a free Syrian army. So there is difficulty of understanding as a whole what is the moderate opposition and how to handle that. First of all, if you allowed me to say one thing, the Iranian uh, colleague, the gentleman, he was talking about the Iran rule in Syria. He talking about Iranian security. As he said, Syria is not a border with Iran. That means can't come from Egypt or Algeria or any other country and is not border with Syria and talk about their security. All the rules of Iranian in Syria, it's just to hold the regime and there's ambulatory dreams in Syria. If we talk about ISIS, ISIS never attacked in Iran for the last three years. And even before that, if we go for 1990 until now, even the Al-Qaeda never attacked Iran. And everybody knows the deep relationship between Iran and Al-Qaeda. This is another story, maybe not now to talk about it. I go back to your question. If we will go to your question, I mentioned something, I write it down. If you allow me to read it for you, please. Just some points. If we will talk about the complication of Syrian crisis, has multiple reasons. One of them, the conflict of interest between the regime friends and the opposition friends. Especially 
the large powers country, if we talk about USA or Russia, EU, and they all try to achieve their interest around the world, not only in Syrian and Mediterranean or Middle East. At the same time, there is also conflict of interest between the friend of parties themselves, between Iran and Russia, USA and Turkey and Saudi Arabia. They all, as the majority of Syrian people say, they all playing with the Syrian blood to achieve their interest and use the Syrian weak souls and mercenaries from the both sides, the regime and the opposition, to be fair. In that case, the, you can see, as you said now, some of the party, you find them, it's moderates in this day, maybe extremes in another day. But this is not truth. I present the Syrian Free Army, I present 57 Madurats brigades, and they are in the ground. But there is no one want to put a light on them. They always try to show the Syrian revolution is only the terrorist, only ISIS. ISIS which made and supported by the regime to attract all the devils around the world and brought them to Syria. If you will talk about ISIS, ISIS and the regime, it's like the stick and the shadow. If you leave, remove the stick, there is no shadow anymore. May I ask you a question? At this point, who is your number one enemy, ISIS or Assad? Both. But both. what's your priority? Who, who would you be fighting first? As I told you, both, and we do fight both. If you see the situation clearly and independent way, you will see the Syrian Free Army, they fight both. If we talk about the last few months, we talk about the Forat Shields. The Forat Shields, of course, some people, they will say, is a Turkish mission. It wasn't Turkish mission. We get support from Turkey as our friend. Like the regime, he takes, takes support from Iran or from Russia, yeah? We take support from them, and the, our Syrian Free Army, they fight ISIS, and they liberate over 5,000 square kilometers. So this is the Syrian Free Army, and they fight ISIS. And in the same time, they fight the regime. And what's happened, the regime attacked theirs from the back when they was attacking ISIS around al Bab city. So if we will talk about that, we should look from the old corner, not take this only an Nusra who is controlling Idlib. If we will talk about that in 19, uh, sorry, in 2012, when the Nusra show up, everybody knows this Nusra was like an intelligence unit planted in the Syrian revolution body from the regime side. And then it grows up these units and attract all the doubles, as, as, as I said, from our, around the world. And we keep fighting them until now and fighting the regime. But one question for everyone, especially for you as a journalist, you had seen always the agreement done between the regime and the Nusra, between the regime and these extreme groups to transfer them from Damascus, from Homs, from Daraya, from many other cities and put them in Idlib. What for? What for he put them in Idlib? If I may, I'm here uh, as a moderator, not a journalist, and I'll be asking you questions if you don't mind. So my next question is about your opposition and what kind of concessions, if any, the Syrian army is ready to make for the sake of the peace. Um, would you be ready to accept maybe Assad stay for a transitional period? Maybe it shouldn't be a prerequisite for the start of the peace talks? I will tell you something. I was also going to say something. In the end of the day, we all, all, all Syrian, yeah? We and the people supporting the regime. Of course, now after this uh, fight for years, you know, it will be some enemies, but that will be under control. It's, uh, it was a war in Lebanon for 16 years in any other country, and people 
forgive each other and continue. But uh, any peace process now with Assad is won't be a, a possible. We talk about Assad and his close people. What for? Even, even there is some people from the opposition side, we want them to be there in, in future of Syria, to be honest. Who had, a, who, uh, who play with the Syrian blood from both sides? We don't want them. And the Assad regime, he is the first player in our blood. And the Assad himself and his close friend. So of course, none of the Syrian people will accept him in the future. Well, what's your plan for people in Syria who still support Assad? Okay, in that case, they are our people, our friend. They're supporting Assad, and there is other people supporting the opposition from other side. But they are, as I said, it's all Syrian. We have no problem of them. I will tell you something, and the others as well. I come from the minority of the Syrian. So if you talk about, I talk about myself, I'm from the minority of Syrian, but I'm from the opposition side. So I never worry about my family and my uh, groups where they are supporting the regime. So we have no problem with them. The problem is with the Assad and few generals ruling the country in the wrong way. I'm playing with our blood. All right, thank you very much. My next question is to Allah Ibrahim. Allah, uh, hello, you are the journalist for the state Syrian TV. You worked with the government almost all your life. You know the way they think. Uh, let me ask you something. If Actually, I didn't work for the government all my life. I spent some time in Syrian state TV, so but I will understand this. But you understand the other side. I mean, you, well, I you're, do understand. You're, you're more enlightened from the other side than the Actually, I'm the enlightened on both sides, so whatever okay. you want. So if the peace talks reach some kind of a compromise, because that's all that everyone wants here. Um, Assad stepping down after a transition period, after an election, do you feel he will be too threatened to abide by that? Because the war has been going on for so long. Where's the guarantee that he's gonna go? Well, I don't think that many people would like to make the issue of what will happen to President Assad as the key issue in any upcoming negotiations. And while this is important of who will rule Syria and what will be the fate of President Assad, but it's not a priority at this point. There are other priorities. The main priority is, as many, many would agree, is combating terror. Because terror is a more urgent and more pressing need. But the problem when it comes to the Syrian conflict that everyone, including regional, international powers and international organizations, they all say we would like a political solution. But at the same time, they continue to support and work for a military one. When countries say we would like to help the Syrians reach an agreement, at the same time, they would be funding, sending weapons, training more rebels or government troops, and uh, they're sending them uh, off to fight each other. But I think the main issue here that we should uh, uh, all remember is that the level of regional involvement in the Syrian conflict makes it very difficult to uh, conceive any solution in Syria before these regional and international powers could actually reach a consensus on what they want to do. And in instead of reaching... Well, the consensus is that they all want to fight ISIS. Well, the they consensus. say that, but they don't actually do it. Because President Gould said, said those who are we are considering terrorist strike now, we're not terrorists from the beginning. But actually, this is not very accurate because when ISIL first moved in from Iraq, it was named the Islamic State, and they sent their uh, agents from Iraq to Syria to establish Al-Qaeda, Syrian affiliate known as Al-Nusra Front, it was a terrorist from the beginning. But I would understand the statements of uh, President Gould because at that time, the Al-Qaeda and later on ISIL were selling its oil through Turkey. So if Turkey knew that they were terrorists, it would have been aiding and abetting these terrorists and these very radical organizations. And also, we should, we should always remember that, like, right now we want to combat ISIL, then why are we fighting against the Syrian army? Why are we supporting people who are actually fighting against the Syrian army? Well, the Syrian army, contrary to what you said in your introduction, is the most effective force fighting ISIL, because if you took a, take a look at the, uh, the map of Syria, you would understand that the areas in which the Syrian army fights ISIL is much larger than anyone. Yeah, but Syrian army couldn't have done it alone, and you know that. Yes, but no one could have done it alone. It's, uh, even the Kurdish militias, they didn't do it alone. They did it with the backing of the US-led coalition, and before that, the backing of the Syrian army, because the Syrian army supported and armed the Kurdish militias for quite some time towards the beginning of the conflict. So it doesn't, it doesn't undertake or undermine the ability of the army that is needing the help of its allies to achieve that. But the army remains to be the biggest fighting force in Syria. 
the most effective one, and the one capable of achieving the largest achievements against ISIL and pushing them out of the largest areas. And again, uh, I told you, I think there's a great deal of people saying one thing and doing the other thing. If we say that such a government is not acceptable at this age of time, as President Gould has said, then how are we to accept a government like Qatar and Turkey is willing to defend the government of Qatar, which is a much worse government than the Syrian government if we have a problem against dictatorships? And that goes on for the same for, for the Euphrates Shield, the operation in which Turkey led an incursion into Syria. And I'm just using the example of Turkey because President Gould has graced, graced us with his presence today. But many regional powers have actually invested in prolonging the Syrian conflict. The United States says it wants a political solution, but at the same time, you always hear the United States establishing a new program to arm the rebels in Syria. The United States establishing a new program to fund rebels. And we've often seen weapons provided from the United States, like the American-made tow missiles, in the hands of the radicals. I think it's a vicious circle because then the same thing can be said about uh, the Syrian government because the Russians and the uh, Iranians are heavily invested in helping Assad combat ISIS. Yes, but then you but have Assad come out on national yes, TV have, and say that he will fight you, militarily, yes, yes, militarily till the end. You have, you have internationally end. designated terror organizations like ISIL and Nusra Front and you would see weapons made by the United States in the hands of these organizations then you would understand something is wrong. These are internationally designated terrorist organizations, and it's not a point of view. Like, I would like Al-Nusra, and I would call them uh, moderates, or I don't like them, I would call them uh, radicals. But the point is that the United Nations said that these two organizations are radical organizations, and these organizations, at least Al-Nusra, are an integral part of the Syrian armed insurgency against the Syrian government, and without them, actually, the rebels don't stand a chance of defeating the government or achieving any substantial military gains. And this is why many countries continue to support the rebels, understanding that this support would reach the radicals, but they said, okay, we will do it uh, because of the lack of an exit strategy. They wanted to topple Assad first, and then we can discuss the rest of the issues. But I think what we're witnessing here right now, after six years of conflict, is that many regional powers wanted to create a, a regime change in Syria. They sent money, they sent weapons, they allowed fighters into the country, and now we ended up with a situation where Syria has become a haven for terrorists. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask my next question to Shahida Tulaganova, who has joined us. Uh, Shahida, welcome. Uh, we've talked a lot with politicians and experts, um, and sometimes people say that those who aren't on the ground are detached from the reality. So you can have a peace process on a paper, but how does it really work when it comes down to it on the ground? And you've seen it all. You've seen from all sides, pretty much. Do you think the Syrian people can reconcile with everything <clears throat> that has happened? Um, it's uh, very amusing to hear men talking about the resolution, because that's the problem with all negotiations, with Geneva, with Astana, you see all these men in suits, with all my due respect, talking about the serious issues of political resolution. I'm a journalist working on the ground. I'm talking to people. I'm a woman, I'm a mother. So when I hear a mother talking about escape from Raqqa with her 14-year-old son who was indoctrinated by ISIS, that she put a sleeping him on hill and they ran away to save his life, that's another story. Um, the best description of what's happening in Syria is coming from a nine-year-old Yusuf from um, uh, Aleppo, who I met in Lebanon. And I asked him to draw Syria for me because the kid didn't speak. He was so traumatized, he couldn't speak. So he took a pen and, pen and, and paper, and he drew a picture of airplanes, tanks, and his house. And I went ask him to describe what he painted, what he drew. He said, this is free Syrian army, this is Syrian army, those are bombs, this is my house, and this is how we escaped. That's all he could say. That's what all, it's all about. It's about children and women, five million refugees. We can talk about political solution to the crisis for hours, for days, for years, like in Geneva. But we can never tackle the trauma these people suffer, and they will suffer for years after that. And that's what we don't realize. And I wish regional powers who do contribute to the military solution of the crisis, helping free Syrian army, helping Syrian government, put as much effort into helping these five million refugees scattered across the region. I do appreciate the efforts of the Turkish government, Mr. Bül, what is happening with Turkish refugees, because I've seen refugee crisis in Lebanon and in Jordan. And this, the, the status of the refugees there is just appalling, despite all the efforts. Turkish government doing a great job in accommodating all these people, and I've seen it myself. Um, however, more needs to be done. We're talking, I, I'm, I'm coming from Europe, and there's a huge debate about refugee crisis, how, much, how many people we can accommodate in Europe. 
you know what? Not many. Not many refugees want to stay in Europe, especially Syrians. 90% uh, of the people we interviewed uh, for the Cries for Syria film want to go back home. That's why they stay in Kilis, in Reyhanla, across the border, because they wait for the time they can go home. And despite this serious security situation, there is ISIS there and everything else, they still wait to go home. And that's a very important point for the, every European government to recognize that they're not, they're not going to stay there. They want to go home. Secondly, define terrorists. We're talking about terrorism here. And everyone, I think, understands terrorism in different ways. Syrian government understood terrorism as um, people who are coming from the opposition-controlled areas, mainly. Um, Iranians, probably, too. Are we talking about ISIS and al-Nusra, or are we talking about the terrorists, who, people who live in the opposition or whatever controlled territories? This is a very important thing. See, um, the conflict in Syria resembles a little bit a conflict in Ukraine in certain ways. But let's not go into that too much. No, 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 I want to talk about terrorists, because for Ukrainian population in Ukraine proper, terrorists are those guys who live in separatist regions. And the same happens with Syrians too. So can we define terrorists? Can we define terrorists, a, mo a mother who uh, ran away from Madaya, from the government besieged area with three kids? Are they terrorists or they're not? Or how we should treat them? In the future Syria, how people like this are going to be treated? Because they, by, uh, by will of, uh, you know, that misfortune had to stay there. And they didn't have a voice to say they want to stay there because they stayed in, in opposition control areas. Are they terrorists or the ISIS terrorists? These are uh, uh, questions to answer. Well, I think we have also some questions uh, from the audience. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please raise your hand, whoever has a question. Try to keep your questions concise and say to whom they are addressed. Good day. I am from Kyrgyzstan, journalist of uh, Moskovsky Komsomolets newspaper. My question is Khairat Kuderbirgenevich, the Kazakh minister. Just two days ago, we heard uh, uh, at the time of the, uh, in relation to the visit of our president to Moscow, that a peacekeeping contingent from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan uh, will take part in that conflict. And in that regard, I have three questions. Aren't we in this case uh, uh, becoming a hostage to interests of other countries in this conflict? And I, I'm, I'm sorry, while I was thinking, I, I forgot the other question. Well, let there be just one question. There will maybe someone else was just one main question. Your question to the minister. We are part of integration uh, uh, unions here, and what if our participation of our forces, let that be peacekeeping forces, perceived as support of one uh, conflict, one of the conflicting parties, wouldn't that later lead to aggression of uh, conflict uh, uh, against our two countries? Thank you. Th thank you for your question. It's of very high relevance, and it became such in one hand due to the above-mentioned memorandum that was adopted by the uh, state's uh, guarantors of the Astana process in May here in Astana in the, as a result of that meeting, and it was that memorandum that stated that four zones, the escalation also means servicing these zones by way of establishing uh, checkpoints and observer points along the perimeter of these for the escalation zones. Secondly, your question is uh, highly relevant uh, in connection to the comments that we heard in response to the speeches of my distinguished Turkish colleagues. There was a press conference, as I understand, in Ankara, and also of Mr. Shamanov in Moscow. Uh, one should carefully read in the quotes uh, that, uh, among others, uh, Russian media uh, presented. They, none of the quotes ever speak that definitely that uh, military servicemen from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are being considered as participants of the peacekeeping process in Syria. Yes. Uh, 
it may be that journalists used quotes uh, and uh, presented uh, some of the things in their interpretation on our part, on the part of Kazakhstan. Let me reassure you, we are not officially negotiating sending our troops to Syria, becoming a hostage. Neither Kazakhstan nor Kyrgyzstan as sovereign, independent and both are very well balanced in their foreign policy countries. It's not by chance that Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are mentioned. We both are actively working also along the lines of peacekeeping operations of the United Nations. Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are actively training their peacekeeping forces to work as part of 16 peacekeeping missions uh, deployed in 16 places of the country. 125, uh, over 125 uh, soldiers and officers. Both countries have good relations with countries, uh, uh, the guarantor countries, but also with any other interested party in uh, resolution of the Syrian situation. So it's not by chance that were mentioned there. But the mechanisms of involving peacekeepers or troops, uh, there are just, uh, there are a lot of discussions. The, the same articles speak of the Organization for Collective Security, which is an organization with its own charter, with its own set procedure of making decisions regarding use of collective peacekeeping forces of uh, the organization. Let me repeat one more time reiterate yesterday's comment that my press service made. Kazakhstan, when it comes even to consideration of this issue of sending its troops to any hot point on the planet, unfortunately there are many such today, only at the condition that this will be discussed in the UN Security Council with the corresponding resolution adopted and the corresponding mandate of the United Nations to send troops of any country for peacekeeping mission. Due to lack of time, I didn't speak of the peacekeeping aspect when it comes to involvement of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, without going further into that direction, uh, let me just say, with all current conditions, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, or any other country that maybe, once again, according to that memorandum, the memorandum says that Guarantor states will ensure functioning of these de-escalation zones, or third countries or parties, provided there is a consensus. So, we shall never become a hostage. And also a third aspect of your question is also very burning. Kazakhstan already, as uh, its president uh, said, as I mentioned uh, in the, my introductory remarks, through its decisive step, when we on our own platform, host uh, seemingly earlier uh, parties that uh, would never come to peace. Uh, we, put, we brought them together. We're making our contribution. And again, once again, the Syrian armed the position. The, head of it, the heads of its delegation, thanks to the reputation of President Nasultan Abish Nazarbayev and Kazakhstan's efforts, ended up sitting at one round table. If you remember, also back in January, one round table with their enemies that they would seemingly would never uh, sit at the same table. So the Astana process serves the cause of establishing peace and stability and ensuring in the future post-war development of Syria. And using uh, this opportunity, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Eurasian Media Forum for providing such a wonderful opportunity, even in the course of this session, to hear first-hand positions of the parties. Very often they may be 
contradicting, but as you see, people are listening to each other, including hopefully uh, the audience that's now uh, watching internet uh, broadcasting have a chance to hear positions of the parties. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We will definitely continue now with the questions, but I would like to address our expert, uh, Bazir Haj Yassim. You heard all our speakers, so how would you briefly sum it up? Do you have any objections or maybe questions? Hi. Microphone, можно? Please use the microphone. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to remind you about some of the words of, that I said in 2012 Из того время даже видно, что ни оппозиция, ни режим уже не умеют ключ к решению. Уже этот вопрос стал больше, чем региональный, даже мировой. В данное время два угроза для цельности ИГИЛ, ДАИШ и сирийская крыла. Крыла, рабочая партия Курдистан, турецкая партия, которая на список террористической организации Турция и НАТО, и в тот же список Казахстан, как террористическая организация. И эти курдистские собратисты, они опасны, чем дальше. Почему? Потому что мы никогда... В последней истории не слышали, что какая-то экстремистская организация могла создать свое государство. У нас, например, Аль-Гайда сколько лет, но сейчас уже никто не вспоминает о ней. Даже Талибан, который там этнос полностью в Аштуне, все равно они воспользовались, какая ситуация. И также в Сирии Даиш воспользовалась этой ситуацией и условиями, и она появилась. Там, конечно, много условий, не время говорит, как появилась эта организация. А курдистские собратисты, они занимают Там, если взять полностью численность курдов в Сирии, они не больше 7% полностью в Сирии. Не умеют они никакой географической То, что есть один город, там может их 35%. Через 200 километров еще один город может они один процент между эти расстояния больности Арабии и Туркмении. И там доказано в течение полтора года сотни дерев уже стерты из земли и веселяли Арабию и Курды. И Турция, я думаю, она знает эту проблему очень хорошо. Взять, например, город Момбоч, который на запад река Еврат. Там где-то 600 тысяч населения. Больше, чем 93% арабы, а 7% не курды. Там курды, туркмени, чаркези, армяне. Там может быть курды 1%, но все равно, с поддержкой военной США, они забрали этот город, подняли свой флаг и поставили его в карту, якобы называемую Курдистан, Сирия. Недавно был военный удар турецкий по одной из баз этих террористов. Через день военные США ходили проверять. Вышли фотографии, там один из лидеров рабочей партии Курдистан, турецкая партия. Ну, здесь вопрос, что делает он, этот человек, был в список три года назад, турецкий список, как террорист. 
He was this on the list of individuals that were wanted by Turkey as a terrorist. So my question is, what is the difference between Daesh and these terrorists? I think that... But they are supported by the United States. But they are supported by the United States. They are supported by the United States. They are supported by the United States. Just like uh, was discussed before, now when we're talking about solutions in Syria, no one wants to remember the reasons. No one wants to ask the question why it happened like a terrorist. Let's not go into those like long history because we have some other things to look at. Big Korea, there are so many changes in the institutions. Not the regime, uh, not the opposition, neither of those want to change the uh, uh, constitution. Uh, the title of the country, uh, the name of the country, uh, is the Syrian uh, Arabic Republic. No one wants to change it either. I should say that it's interesting, it seems to be interesting to many But there is a lot of population in the north of supporting the policy of Turkey, uh, President, uh, President Erdogan. I tell you why, because there is no single uh, Arabic official or journalist None of them has ever talked about uh, those Arabs in the north of Syria Erdogan being displaced. It's just Turkey and Erdogan who says all the time the that the cities where the Arabs are, the Turks will occupy the city, the Daesh 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 will occupy the city, any of the panelists that would like to refer to it. Um, from an Israeli perspective, and I have to, uh, I have to uh, give you a couple of uh, very speedy comments. Um, since, uh, since 2013, Israel has uh, quietly treated far more than 3,000 war-wounded Syrians, saving lives of many of them in our uh, medical center in Safed. Um, Nevertheless, uh, Israel is, is attributed in a way uh, of, of capability that are some, somewhat uh, omnipotent. But what Russia and the US uh, weren't capable of doing, Israel isn't capable and isn't willing to do. It stays uninvolved on the sidelines, countering spillover of terrorism uh, on its borders. My question relates to um, Israel's main concern, and I believe that this is also Turkey's concern and, um, and Jordan's concern. Um, any arrangement, any regulation of the current chaos and bloodshed that would uh, leave Assad in power would inevitably empower and award Iran. This is uh, detriment to Israel, to Turkey, to Jordan, to other countries in the um, in the neighborhood. How do you deal with that? Thank you. Please, who wants to answer? Volunteers? Sure. First of all, this is another example of how misconception, misinformation are spread about the Syrian conflict. He says that 3,000 wounded have been treated, and he neglects the fact that most of those treated were actually militants uh, and fighters within the rebels and were treated and then sent back to fight again against the Syrian army. Israel has been actively, actively involved in building what they call a security parameter or security area between uh, the occupied Golan and the areas under the control of the Syrian government, bearing in mind that Israeli presence along the borders with Syria is illegal because Israel continues to occupy the Golan Heights and Israel, according to United Nations Security Council resolution, this is illegal and they should leave, but obviously this is not happening. So Israel has been actively involved from an intelligence point of view, from treating point of view, from logistics, from providing aid, 
and, and many other things. So, and they have always said that their main interest is not to allow actually uh, Assad to win and not to allow actually Iran to increase its influence in Syria. And the way I see it, this is another example of what I said before. We, want, we don't want to get involved in the conflict, but we don't want this result of the conflict. And we are working to achieve this, this goal. So how, how are we not involved, actually? I think, I think this is very involved in the conflict. Thank you, Allah. Uh, Shahida, I see you shaking comment. your head. Yeah, that, Excuse I, me. Yeah, I Shahida, have a comment. and then you will comment. Please, Strongly Shahida disagree first. disagree with you about the militants. Those are mostly civilians. Who, actually, who is I'll disagree with I, more. I, I, I know personally. And, and I work... I now work in Israel. Can we speak? And please, can we agree that there are probably please. a mixed crowd, but who I saw were civilians. Uh, secondly, okay, we're not talking everyone. about. You can, no. You can't you can, you can say percentage. No, I see what I can see. I, I saw the civilians. Allah, please, you were allowed to speak and nobody interrupted. Please yes. let her finish. Secondly, we can always talk about Iran and everything else. Assad, President Assad, or whoever he is, probably will stay in power for the transitional period. But for the war crimes he committed and his regime committed, he should really stand by the tribunal. It's not about empowering Iran. It's about dealing with Assad and what he did to the Syrian people and the war crimes he committed, his regime committed, and th thousands of people who died in jails, and you know pretty much very well how people are treated in, and tortured in jails, as well as everyone else who, is, who committed war crimes has to stand by the tribunal. And so it's not about Iran. It's about dealing with Assad, from my point of view. Mr. Hudaifa, shortly, please. Actually, I'm not here to defend the Israeli government, but uh, the gentleman, he talked about 3,000 wounded. I'm agreed with that. They was civilian and uh, wounded by the uh, regime and Hezbollah and the Iranian militias and Iraqi militias. And they are really civilians, some of them from the Syrian Free Army fighter, that's it, but not terrorists. The regime supporters and speakers all the time, they try to talk about, to say, we are all terrorists and they are the innocent. And all we know, the terrorist groups they had made by the regime in 2011, in one of the Assad's, Assad's speech, he talks about 65,000 criminal and Islamic uh, radicals people has been released from his jail by his amnesty. And all these groups, they've been armed by his multiple organiza uh, intelligence organization. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Yes. Please, Hi. sir. Yeah, I'm Akhlaq Usmani, independent journalist from India. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Salim, and uh, uh, the question is the same, but I seek answer from two panelists. Uh, Mr. Hudaifa and Barziga. How you both analyze the role of Wahhabism, the deadliest ideology of this century, which have been uh, propelled by, funded by the Arab monarchs, and uh, uh, you see in, in the uh, whole conflict area, you see the uh, series of um, uh, Wahhabi madrasas, they have, you know, uh, made, uh, they brainwash a uh, uh, largest group of youth. So, uh, Mr. Hudefa, how do you analyze the role of uh, ideology of Wahhabism and Mr. Barzugat? Please, let's start with you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is a good question because I wanted to connect with uh, our Syrian friends' uh, comments about Iran and uh, saying that there is no enmity between Iran and Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups. And this connects to this Wahhabism and how much it is strong in Iran in terms of endangering Iran's nation state. And that goes directly to Iran's national security concern. And by that, Iran can mobilize its energy and forces to battle that. And it is not secret that Iran has battled uh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and today, uh, it is genuinely battling this. Perhaps you might have heard that Iran is a country that is a stable and some uh, elements in the Arab world try to connect that to the fact that uh, Iran might have some connections with ISIS. But with the recent threat, uh, recent incident in Tehran that ISIS attacked uh, Tehran, we saw that uh, Iran is encircled with a different extremist group 
And the way that Iran is uh, 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 trying to deal with that, it's, it has uh, uh, been sometimes uh, full of energy and cost for Iran economically, because we have this debate inside Iran that this might be uh, costly. But I can assure you that no country will endanger its national security in broader context to use uh, an element as a tool for endangering its uh, security. Therefore, I think your comment is inaccurate. And when it goes to the Wahhabism, uh, Takfiri uh, uh, forces around Iran, I think Iran is determined to battle that. And it has paid a lot for that. It's very obvious. And we see this. First of all, there is nothing called Wahhabi. There is uh, Islamic uh, extremes, uh, groups, and the other moderates, but nothing called Wahhabi. Wahhabi, it's just kind of, of, of education or kind of, of uh, uh, one of the sheikhs, he had his own, own way to understand the Islam or the Quran, nothing to call Wahhabi. But if you will ask about the radical groups and the terrorist group, uh, how we uh, achieve that, uh, first of all, that uh, radicals, it's uh, ideology, or I, I call it a death education. We should uh, issue uh, a life education, I will call it. Uh, and that way, uh, we have to reset a, a new uh, program against these people, not as uh, bring another people like uh, what the Iran did. For example, we talk about Wahhabi, as you like to say it, so there is also the, the, the Fatimiyun and the uh, Shia groups, which uh, Zainabiyun and uh, you know with some of them in Iraq now, they, ca they kill for Al Hussein uh, or uh, Fatima or others. You know all these. You can't call it uh, 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 Zainabiyun or, or Wahhabiyun or Fatimiyun. They call themselves like that, but in the end of the day, they kill for a political reason. As I said in the beginning, Iran, they try to keep the regime because the regime will uh, help them to get their dream, to reach the warm water in the Mediterranean Sea, and they build their ambulatory, dreams ambulatory all the time. So that's the fight between two ideology, not about Wahhabi and the others. Thank you. Gentlemen in the second row, please. Можно микрофон вот сюда. Thank you. My name is Günter Knabe. I'm a journalist from Germany. I would like to address a particular humanitarian problem. That's the one of the refugees we have taken in Germany. As you know, it's a roughly number of 900,000 or 1 billion. As long as the fighting is going on, we have to take care of them. But then I would like to address one problem. And I would like to ask the two panelists from Syria. In Germany, we try to kind of integrate those refugees, sending the children to school, uh, training the people in vocational things, or even already engaging them in their jobs if they are trained already. Now, the problem is, if they are integrated in our German society, and many of them strive very hardly so, and they are really welcome. There is a very slim chance that if ever and whenever the war in Syria will be at an end, they will go back to Syria. They will probably stay in Germany. Your advice, should we simply care for them until the war is over, or should we train them and integrate them in Germany and our society, then they are lost for Syria's future? What's your opinion, please? Who wants to start, Allah? Yeah, go ahead. I think they should go back to Syria. Oh, he will talk, or? Go ahead, since you okay. started, it's yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. Please, Mr. Allah. I should, uh, I think you should uh, keep them in, 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 in uh, education level, but just to go back in Syria, not to stay, to remain in German forever. 
because we need them for our future, as I mean Syrian future. But uh, before that, we have to make the Syrian future uh, first. And how we make the Syrian future? Just to agree about to stop the war. And to stop the war in, in, in Syria, we have to take a serious action against the regime and the terrorist groups in Syria, created by regime or by others. Can we not Never come mind. back to the regime and terrorist no. groups? The question is about the refugees. No, no, no. Please. But, but this, is, this is the main key to establish the Syrian future. This is the main key to stop the war. And how we stop the war? Now I'm not talking about the regime only. I said also the terrorist group, terrorist group, which is the, we don't talk about ISIS and Nusra because these two groups, it's over now, it's game over. These black eagle, they gone, but we talk about their egg. That's what we talk about it. This is the future of Syria. Thank you, Allah. Well, I think, first of all, this is a very, very important question. And I think we should start with making the distinction between two categories of people who actually left Syria and went into Germany. The first category who were forced out of the country because of the violence and who actually had to run for their lives and then benefited from uh, a certain period where the procedures and, uh, and the situation that allowed them to actually cross from Syria into Turkey, then into Greece and all the way into Germany. And I think for those people, uh, the possibility of returning to Syria is higher than the other category. The other category is well-educated, Syrian engineers, doctors, uh, PhD students, researchers, and those people actually left the country, not because of a direct threat on their life, like the first category, but they left actually because they wanted to pursue a better life. They wanted to pursue a, uh, a better future, a better academic career, or actually uh, a better economic situation for themselves and their families. I think for the second party, and I'm speaking here from personal experience, my sister is doing a PhD right now in Germany, I think it will be very difficult for them to conceive returning to the country after they have established themselves in Germany and in the German academic or in, uh, in the German society in general. But for the first category, those who were forced out of the country because of the violence, who are less educated, who are less fortunate in terms of financial situation, I think when presented with the opportunity, they would like to come back to Syria and return to their houses and their old lives. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question. Please, sir, in the second row. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, everybody was talking about the situation and this, I get the feeling from the panel that this conflict will be really continuing for some time. Uh, however, there's a new development in the, uh, the Middle East with Saudi Arabia. Now changing the prince, uh, crown prince, is already with, uh, on the news you hear that there is a conflict. Uh, between uh, you know uh, people there, and another thing that is basically the, the Saudi Arabia the, the basically ordering uh, uh, Turkey to uh, leave. I like to, they have 200 soldiers, less than 200 soldiers, ordering them to leave uh, uh, the Qatar. And the, the answer was very very straightforward from Turkey that they did, they will not uh, leave Qatar now. This conflict is increasing to the extent that I think there will be another Muslim countries, other Muslim countries, getting into conflict. And we know that this has been encouraged for some times now. I want to get the point of view of anybody on the panel. Now, if this conflict starts, there is beneficiary of these conflicts, as I said uh, before, that the, you, uh, you know, the oil companies in US will be you know, the dancing if it would be with the, the production of oil in the market will be uh, the, uh, in the Gulf region will be reduced because the price will go up. Of course, Russia would be a beneficial from that. So if this, if, if this happens, uh, where this conflict will go? Do we have other, uh, again, Muslim countries killing each other and they get weapons from different parts of the so world. So how will the region be redrawn, basically, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay, President Gül, you have been quiet for some time. Please. 
the first of all, uh, there is no conflict between Turkey and Saudi Arabia and with the other Gulf states. We are all friends and we have many agreements uh, with all of them. Uh, definitely we are not happy to see another uh, crisis in the Gulf uh, as if uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, all these are not enough to see another crisis among the Muslim countries is, 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 is not good, of course. Uh, I'm sure that uh, with negotiation, political dialogue, uh, this problem will be settled, should be settled, in fact. Uh, uh, there are fresh uh, lessons that uh, all the region should get. Uh, uh, then, uh, my friend, Surian friend, I understand him, of course. I mean, uh, the huge problem they are facing and uh, Surian is in fire. But uh, between Qatar and Surian, there is a difference, of course. I mean, in Surian, millions of people were in the street at the beginning just to ask their legitimate demand. If that could have been handled uh, in a different way, maybe all this can be uh, avoided. Uh, so just I want to uh, point out this, uh, but I understand, of course, uh, all of them are suffering, all of them are in pain, and as their friends, uh, we are not happy, of course, to see them in this problem, and all of us, all the neighbors, is duty to help them to come together and to solve the problem. Uh, it, was, it is clear that uh, there will not be any uh, result uh, to continue to this, this war. Uh, maybe at the beginning, each side uh, concentrated to get more stronghold in the, on the ground in order to be stronger around the table. But uh, all the process proved that there is no end for this. So I think it's time to uh, talk, and therefore the Astana meetings are very much uh, useful. Really. Geneva is uh, very important. At the beginning, Kofi Annan, as a representative of the uh, Secretary General, he was not supported, I know this. And then the Ibrahimi, uh, another representative of the UN Secretary General, he was very much uh, wise and uh, eager to, 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 to contribute, but he was not also supported that time, I know. Uh, I think uh, it's time uh, to realize the realities and then uh, compromise this. Of course, the new Syria uh, is important. Now, we are talking about the refugees. Uh, one million refugees in Germany, more than three millions in Turkey, in Palestine, in Jordan. Almost half of the Jordanian population, they have the refugees. So definitely, we have to encourage them to go back in order for them to encourage. Nim Suriye should be attractive for them, should be safe for them. So it is the duty of the Syrian people to create that, and it is the duty of the neighbors to help them. I'm sure that uh, this has to be, this will be achieved. Thank you, President. Uh, Foreign Minister, I'd like to uh, hear from you shortly as well on the same question. How do you think the Shia-Sunni paradigm will play out in a post-Syrian world in the region? How do you see it as someone who observes everything from the outside? Well, uh, with your permission, I will uh, touch upon two um, issues to that regard. I would like to remind uh, distinguished participants, and especially those who are coming from OIC member states of Organization of Islamic Cooperation, that it was Istanbul summit when, of OIC when two presidents, Sultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan and President Erdogan of the Republic of Turkey, came out with a statement calling for Islamic rapprochement to unite ourselves in front of so many other challenges and threats of transnational 
crown the boundary nature, our Islamic Ummah in particular facing even today, even these hours. So this is very much important initiative. The second aspect is about one thing which shall bring all of us together. Obviously, every country has its own foreign policy, has its own domestic one, military goals, national interests. And the thing which to unite all of us is to fight against terrorism. And I refer also to previous, uh, to that question with regard to the situation, uh, awful situation in the Gulf. Uh, and it's time now to reveal the promised list of initiatives which we uh, announced uh, two, two years ago, and it was on behalf of my president at the uh, anniversary session of the United Nations General Assembly. With your permission, I will refer to, the, to some um, of items of that uh, uh, agenda aiming at combating terrorism. It was a proposal to establish under the auspices of the United Nations a single global anti-terroristic coalition to combat transnational terrorism and extremism. And extremism has also a violent nature, as you know. It was a proposal to develop and adopt a comprehensive convention on combating international terrorism under the auspices of the United Nations. It was an initiative to agree finally on a unified definition of terrorism and violent extremism. It is a plea to adopt a common list of terrorist organizations under the auspices of the United Nations Security Council. It was an initiative to make sure that all Security Council's resolutions and decisions related to combating violent extremism, binding and necessary to implement and to approve the main pillars of the UN Global counterterrorism strategy. And if you know, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, today is making very robust steps in order to streamline anti-terroristic activity of the United Nations. It was also, on behalf of my president, a call to implement a unified mechanism on finding, apprehending, and extraditing of individuals involved in committing terrorist acts. So uh, in order to promote above mentioned um, initiatives of my president, we are working now with, together with international experts and those from the, including from, uh, first of all, from the United Nations in elaborating Astana code of conduct uh, during anti-terroristic operations. So probably, if we to start uniting ourselves around such kind of initiatives, and Kazakhstan is not alone to that end, we could reach a significant breakthrough in tackling so many issues the globe facing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Foreign Minister. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for this session, unfortunately. I would like to thank each one of the speakers for coming and for your input in this panel. Thank you, Les Gentmu, for coming and for your questions as well. And hopefully the process can take off from here and reach some consensus for Syria. Thank you.